Hello, it's James here. It's part five of Open Dog, the open source dog robot, which is modelled on a robot roughly the size of the Boston Dynamics Spot Mini robot. And I keep saying it's not going to be as good as that because I'm not as good as Boston Dynamics, but we'll let you decide. So we've made quite a lot of it so far. Last time we made this chassis with CNC aluminium on my CNC machine. I've already prototyped the leg and some other things. We'll have a closer look at those in a minute. But first of all, I just wanted to say thanks for all the comments on the CNC video. Yes, some mistakes were made. I was using the wrong cutting bit and that's why I could only cut really shallow. I've got the right cutting bit now and we're gonna cut some more parts and hopefully we can do deeper depths of cut. But I just wanted to say the project is totally open source. I'm publishing files as I go, which you can find in the link in the description below. And it's totally open source, which means you can commercialize it or you can modify it and commercialize it as long as you publish the source. And that's under a GPL3 license. So let's have a closer look at the pieces. So here's the chassis we made last time. It's got six mil aluminum plate that was cut out on the CNC machine. We've got some 3D printed parts attaching it to this aluminum extrusion. And these pieces are on bearings and that is the hip motion of the robot. I also previously prototyped this leg and this other actuator for that hip motion. And we're gonna be looking at this one again today, hopefully making some of those plastic parts in metal instead. And yes, all the parts are gonna be color coordinated the same. So let's quickly have a look at those router bits. This was the one I was using last time and you can see it's got four teeth on there which are called flutes and that meant I had too much friction and essentially um, I should have halved the RPM and I guess doubled the feed rate. My feeds and speeds are, to start with were in fact correct for a two flute cutter which you should be using for aluminium. See how it's only got two teeth so I, I can cut there about 85 millimeters a second at 22,000 RPM and that should have made nice chips and I should have been able to cut down to about one and a half millimeters. As it was, I was using this and I found I could only cut about 0.1 millimeters. So it took a very long time to do all those passes. So we're gonna up that a bit today and cut the rest of the parts with the correct bit. So here's the overview of the robot from a couple of episodes ago. Obviously we've uh, made the main body here and the idea was here of course that the leg can tip this way. And that's what that actuator is that I just showed you, which is living down here. And there's two of them, in fact, because uh, obviously it's got four legs. There'll be four, but there's two at each end of the robot, uh, which operate those two hip motions. So last time we went and stripped all of that out and we actually designed the parts we're going to make and made those plates, of course, and fitted them onto the extrusion. And we've got the 4040s in that fit in those things which are mounted with bearings. So we've continued with that a little bit this time. And of course got these plates in that make up the legs and they have 4040 extrusions sandwiched in between them and again in here. So that means where well, actuator can push between these bushings and it's pushing between two bits of aluminium plate with the 4040 there. So um, basically what I've done is stripped out those parts. Of course we've got opposites because you'll notice that one of them curves around this way and one of them curves around the other way. So we have to be careful we cut the right quantity of each. So I've laid those out how they'll fit on my sheet, made a sketch there and exported that sketch into Vectric Aspire. So that's my 2D layout on my piece of aluminium sheet which is 4mm and it's 50 centimetres by 50 centimetres or 500 by 500 millimetres. Um, and what I've done is uh, basically selected this and made lots of different tool profiles. So we've got um, some pockets to cut out these 30mm holes here and we've got um, a general slotting profile to cut the contour and this time we're going to do a tool change and we're going to do a drilling profile to go and cut out all of those holes with an actual drill bit this time. So that's what all my tool paths here. If we go and uh, look at that we can simulate it so that's pretty much the uh, tool paths. If I tick all of those we can see that thing there and then if we preview them we can actually see it simulate and cut out. So I've left tabs here and um, so on, there we go, that's the clearing that's gone and done a pocket all the way through to clear out where those holes are so it doesn't leave a piece that pops out. So as I say, I'm gonna be using a drilling profile for all these holes, they're all being drilled to four mil. Some of them will be to manually be drilled out to 10 mil for that studding, but the rest are four mil holes anyway. So I've now got a collet that will take a four mil drill. This time, as you can see, it cuts pretty quick. And that's because I'm only doing uh, passes which are 0.4 millimetres instead of 0.1 millimetres. I think I can cut down to one and a half millimetres, but I'm being a bit cautious and we'll take it deeper and deeper and see how it goes. And this time I'm cutting up at 85 millimetres a second with a six mil cutter and I'm cutting 
at 22,000 RPM. So we're gonna start off with a sheet of four mil in the machine and a four mil drill bit. So this is a standard four mil cobalt drill bit, a pretty good quality one. I've got a four mil collet now for my uh, chuck there or whatever you wanna call that. So now we can put that into the cutter and we can drill the holes properly. So just using the auto zero tool to get the end of that drill bit to be zeroed on the bed there. And I've just found my XY zero for the piece so we can use that for all of the tools. Right, it's drilled all the holes. There's a bit of aluminium swarf on the drill bit, but nothing I can't pull off with my fingers there, so nothing melted in, so that seems to have been pretty good for it. We're now going to go and swap that for the six mil end mill. This one with two flutes, not four, which was my mistake last time. We'll have to re-zero it, because this is shorter, and then we can cut the other profile. If I now hit go to zero, it should go back to the zero here with my new offset. I've just hit the screw for that cutting bit. So I've actually cut two sheets like this. So we've got uh, the parts for each leg on there. So those are mirrors and that means we've got with two sheets enough for all four legs. So these have come out really well. They're pretty clean actually. Might have to do a bit of deburring. Of course I need to take the tabs out where the pieces are held in. But the sides have got a really good finish on them. Yeah those 30mm holes came out really well there. We're going to stick some steel tube in there. So we need to just basically stick the tube in, see if it fits and maybe tolerance it slightly with a file. But I know the CNC machine is pretty accurate and the 30mm tube is just under 30mm. So here are all of those parts now and you'll notice that some of these are the opposite way around but all the 30mm holes are in the same place and so is that which is where the 10mm hole goes. So if I take some of those off you should find that in the same place, so all my legs are the same way around. None of these holes went all the way through, so I need to drill them out to four mil, but they should be four mil. I should have probably just made sure they did drill all the way through on the CNC. But we'll also have to drill out the 10 mil with a step drill. Right, you joined me trying to drill these holes out to 10 mil. I did actually try using a step drill, but basically aluminium just melted on it. So I found that just a normal drill bit works fine in the end. So these plates now, of course, fit either side of this extrusion, and that's what those holes are for there. That's what the pivot point is there for the pusher on the actuator on the upper leg. And that 30 mil hole there is for the steel to make the actual pivot point for the shoulder essentially. So we've got one of these that fits either side and of course the opposite ones go on the other side. But what you'll notice is we need to make a hole through that extrusion so that 30 mil tube can pass all the way through. So I've refitted those parts with the holes. Obviously we've cut holes all the way through this. There's hardly anything left of the extrusion. There's a bit of a weak spot there, but that's okay because we've got this four mil aluminium plate, of course, to fix either side, which should make it lovely and strong again. So we need to bolt that on, but we need some other bits of 3D print first. So 
So we've made these clamps that the 30 mil steel tube goes through. I was gonna make them out of aluminium, but I thought I'd save some weight and use 3D prints for now. Obviously the tube is quite tight in the hole on the aluminium anyway. Um, these do have clamps that I can tighten up. I was gonna try and find some things off the shelf in steel, but I couldn't find any with a flange to screw them down. I've also made these bushings for the 4040 that my 10 mil is gonna go through for the pivot points for that actuator. So these of course now fit on here. We need to put some more bolts in all the way through here and we need to put that 4040 underneath as well and put the other plate on the other side. So those plates are all fitted now, all eight of them. And obviously that is our hip pivot point there. So our tube goes in there, which is where the legs mount either side. Yep, it's gonna look something like this with its legs. One there, of course, and one there, and two on the other side. So of course the actuators fit in here. So as this turns, this gets longer and that causes those to pivot. Of course, the other one will go in facing the other way, back to back to move the other leg. So let's have a look at this actuator design. So this is moving on from the actuator we prototyped in part three. So I've now got the motor mount and the encoder mount in there. Uh, pretty much everything else is the same. We're still actually gonna start with some 3D printed parts on this until I work out whether they need to be metal or not. So the main piece that's gonna be metal in this is the plate that we previously made out of plastic. So we need to cut that out on the CNC in six mil aluminium and then try and assemble the whole thing. And we need four of them, of course. Yep, I cut the pieces for those actuators out of the scrap from last time. This is one of the other open dog pieces that we cut in the last episode. So they just fitted in the corner there. Some of them are a tiny bit short, but it won't affect the functionality because they'll still be totally solid. And this is six mil aluminium plate. So those are all my parts for those actuators, except for the ball screws. So I've drilled out all the holes in the plates and I've printed all these parts. These are gonna be plastic to start with, but of course I can go back and upgrade them to aluminium if I want to. There's quite a lot of chunkiness in that. So for now, we're gonna save the weight. So again, I used the coal cutting saw to cut this hole. I probably should have done it on the CNC and I've countersunk all these to six mil. You'll notice the difference between the previous design of the actuator is I've got this side piece here and that is to hold the back of the motor and the encoder. So I've got these with bearings in that fit on there. And of course I've made opposites because we need some that face up and some that face down. So I fitted all my linear bearings to my uh, plate there and that bit of 2020 extrusion. And last time, if you remember, what we did was ground down some bolt heads so they fit in there and I can clamp that 10 mil onto the extrusion. This time I've just decided to do a little captive nut. So I've filed those round holes out square We've got these flat nuts that fit neatly in there. And of course that means that we can put the bearing block on top and the nuts captive inside. Similarly on the pusher, that's actually gonna be the actuator. We've done a 10 mil captive nut there as well. That means we don't have to grind down any bolt heads and there's plenty of clearance for it. So these parts are plastic and so is the saddle again this time. Um, we can upgrade those to metal as I say, but I think they'll be strong enough for now. I've got these slots in all the pieces so that we can actually put a four mil through and clamp that 12 mil bar that fits in there. But I think that'll do for now. I think it'll actually be strong enough and if we need to upgrade it, we can come back and do it later. Last time I talked about the weak spot where obviously that plastic has broken there and that weak spot is just here on that uh, plate. So it's where the screw holes holding the um, linear bearings on and that T-piece and obviously this needs to slide right up so we can't make it any wider. I think this will probably be strong enough in six mil aluminium plate but the plan was to put another plate along the bottom here um, and put some longer five mils in here and just have a thing that um, couples along the bottom so it's evenly braced on both sides but I'm going to leave it for now and we can always come back and add that as well. All right I've assembled four of the actuators they're not quite all assembled because I haven't got the pushers on there yet. We've still got to put those bars in and the other thing at the end. And the 10 mil's got to go on as well to attach them to the pivot points. But apart from that, we've got most of the features. All my belts are nice and tight, so that runs the ball screw. And we've got the place on the back end there to put the encoder, which screws onto those screws and sits on there. Same as we did with the other ones, I still don't have a lathe to turn down the aluminium pieces that come with the motors. Right, that's all the actuators built. I've got those pushers on there now. So obviously these things are clamped on with bolts through, which I think will be good enough. And the same at the other end there. 
So now as the ball screw turns, this gets longer. So I, now I need to put that 10 mil studding in there and there, and we can bolt them on the robot. Right, two of the actuators are in and um, everything looks like it works pretty much. So that's good. Um, Pretty happy with that altogether, I think. Um, it's tight in there, but it does fit together. The only thing I didn't really take into account, there was supposed to be a clearance between the two actuators, which was this, and it's big enough to get my finger in. Apart from that nut that you can see there, which I should have recessed into the motor mount, and obviously the same issue is round the back on the other one. There is about a mil or two of clearance there, so millimeters that is. So I'm pretty happy that that's okay, although I could remake the motor bracket, as I say, in the future if it becomes an issue. I still need to actually put the encoder on the back of the motor, but the motor wires you'll see come out the same direction, and that's the same for the other motor coming out the other side. So I should add that the end of the actuator has the 10 mil screwed into it. There's obviously a captive nut in this end and a nut here that's done up tight against it to grip the piece of 10 mil shaft. And then obviously these washers are loose because the 10 mil runs in the bushings loose. So that means it's attached to the actuator and it runs through both of these as if they're bearings. And that is of course true on the other end of the actuator with that captive nut in there and the nut done up tight against it. And again, the 10 mil shaft runs freely in the bushings. Right, it's all together. So there we go, I've got all four actuators in. So let's just pick this up. Oh, I think it weighs about 15 kilograms. So the whole thing is probably gonna be 35, maybe more than that, which is pretty much what I estimated. So if I just wind this motor up one way or the other, we can see this side moving. So let's wind that all, to, all the way to the end. So that's the end stop that way. So we can see we've got that slope on the leg. And that's the end stop the other way. So that gives us roughly, I think we calculated 15 degrees in the cat. It looks like more than that. So that's more than enough for the leg motion. So this is also really rigid. Those actuators have virtually no backlash. There's a tiny bit of play in this bolt, but pretty much I can hardly move that. So obviously we're stacking the knee joint on the hip joint on the other hip joint. So robot joint wobbles are really bad thing. There's a lot of it in Robot X, but this is, you know, there's virtually nothing in there. I can't apply any force to that because ball screws you can't back drive and all my joints are really tight. So that should make it really easy to control. So let's look at that leg again. Of course, they all go on there. We need to uh, obviously revisit that leg and make the CNC aluminium parts for it, sort out all the hinges and everything. But there we go, that's the sort of size that it's gonna be. It's gonna be a pretty substantial robot. So I said the joints are rigid and that's really important for control. Eventually we'd like to have some shock absorbers, like some suspension springs in there so it can absorb load as it goes along because it can have quite a lot of mass, but that's really hard to then calculate the mathematical model. So if we put that in, it's gonna be deliberate, it's got to be measured so we can build those new lengths or positions of joints into that mathematical model and still keep control over the robot. If we just had loose joints, it'd be a nightmare because we wouldn't know where the robot's moving because of course the encoders are on the motors and the motors then relate to the joint angles. And if those joint angles aren't where it expects to be, then it's gonna be very hard to control. So that's something that's gonna come at a later stage. For now, it's much easier to make it really rigid and then we can predict easily where those ends of the feet are gonna be based on the inverse kinematic model that we're gonna build with trigonometry basically in code. So next time I'm gonna try and get all of the legs on. We may not get the motors mounted because there's quite a lot of work to do to build all of those four legs, but it should be standing on its legs at the end of the next episode. So that's what's coming up. But thanks for watching, it is an open source project so you can get the Canon code in the link in the description below. And don't forget that this project is funded through Patreon and it wouldn't really be possible without patrons because, you know, all of these 12 motors is going to add up to quite a bit of money. So don't forget to check out patreon.com slash xrobots and you can get access to some exclusive rewards including a live stream with me and all my videos early and some other stuff so take a look at that. Alright, that's all for now.